And good afternoon, everybody. I'm just going to switch over to my slides. Uh, there we go. Okay. And I also want to see the chat box because I'm going to get a few things going on in the chat box. Hope you can all hear me. Thank you, whoever's liked Practical Introduction to Teach Training. Uh, very nice to sort of be with you all this afternoon. I've been here since uh, Anna's talk earlier, I think. So I've been enjoying the, the various talks and I've already seen a lot of the talks have been on the topic of online teaching, not surprisingly. Um, my connection with online teaching, my first online course I developed in 2004 in the kind of early days, we started trying to put teacher training online. Um, and like the rest of you, I've been doing Zoom teaching since about March. I have some students that I work with in Oxford. And I also work for Oxford University and we run a course in online course design uh, which isn't just for language teachers, it's for anybody who wants to put their training online. And a lot of that work is asynchronous work using Moodle and um, LMS platforms like Moodle and so on. So I'm going to draw on some of that content uh, in this session. And a lot of what I'm going to say links back to previous talks you've had today. And a lot of what I'm going to say will not necessarily be new to you, but it might make you think about things you've been doing in a slightly um, different way. This talk actually originates six months ago around March, April, when the world was going into lockdown and suddenly teachers were being asked to teach online. And um, you might know I do uh, quite a lot of work with National Geographic Learning, the publisher. And they carried out a survey um, with teachers around the world because they wanted to know how teachers were handling the whole online learning thing. And uh, we had nearly 7,000 teachers respond to the survey from 123 countries, uh, with 87% of those being teachers. The other 13% were people, the managers of schools and so on. Um, and they gave us lots of interesting data and we were finding out all sorts of things that were happening and not happening in online classes. Um, and one of the most interesting questions for me that they had to answer was, well, what are the main challenges? Now, if you cast your mind back to March, April, in the chat box, just type what were some of the immediate challenges you had? Just type a challenge you had, or maybe now when you're teaching with Zoom or working online, what were the problems? Internet connections, that was the starting point, yeah, the technology. Um, and there you can see the first thousand people um, said using the technology effectively or just using the technology was one of the challenges. It wasn't the biggest challenge, but it was one of the challenges. Uh, that's a nice one, you know, convincing students they can learn online, lack of live talk with colleagues, teaching small kids, parents translating. A lot of those initial problems were actually the technology at home or the lack of the internet connection. Group activities, adjusting to breakout rooms, yeah, from Harvey, uh, access to devices, speaking activities, background noise, all sorts of things were were problematic in those uh, those early challenges. Yes, yeah, students with cameras off, that's a weird one, isn't it? Because then, yeah, I have that problem, just them loading up profile pictures. Uh, another two and a half thousand said, well, providing interactive lessons. Um, once they'd got the technology to work, they were thinking, well, we're doing the lessons, we're showing students the course book, but we just can't make these lessons interactive. They're not as exciting as doing face-to-face -face classes. That's an important one, Amy, some students using phones instead of laptops. I find that really quite frustrating. I think it's quite hard to do lessons through phones, but of course not all students have access to laptops. So that's another issue again, that's a tech issue as well. Um, providing interactive lessons, but the biggest challenge on the survey, which I thought was interesting, half the survey said just maintaining and engaging the learners. It was that problem of, once you've got the tech, once you've got the lessons up and running, how do you keep their motivation and their engagement going? That's the biggest challenge, actually. It's not that initial problem of the tech. It's, it's keeping it going. 
And as in Poland and the UK, we're going into our second lockdown and we've got to say to the students, hey, okay, everybody back on Zoom. And how are we gonna maintain and engage that learning? I think that's a real challenge. Now, um, with my work with National Geographic and I do a lot of course book writing and so on, we've been doing a lot of teacher support um, with the materials, looking at how you adapt course content and so on into a digital format and sharing it on Zoom and so on. And in the last few weeks or the last few months in webinars, lots of people have presented different models of online learning. And some people have said you can even improve learning through online learning, which I'm not totally convinced about. I think it transforms it in certain ways. But one model that I want to share with you in this session, it wasn't a model I created myself. It was a model actually that is 20 years old now and was one of the first ways of thinking about online learning to begin 20 years later. And it sort of survived the test of time. But I'm always surprised that people haven't heard of the model. Um, so I'm gonna present it today. If you've heard of it, I'm gonna come at it in a slightly different angle because I'm gonna show how the model relates to English language teaching. But it is a model that was originally set up for asynchronous learning. So people working with Moodle and LMS platforms. But I think it relates to Zoom or synchronous learning as well. It comes from Jilly Salmon. She has a website, jillysalmon.com. And she created something called the five stage model. She also, if I can find it, produced a very good book. I'm showing in my camera her book called E-Moderating, which is now in its third edition. I'll give you the references at the end, um, but you'll find most of the, the stuff on her website. But basically she presents a scaffold for approaching online learning. And I think it really holds up. So I'm gonna share it with you now, talk you through it, and then you can take it or leave it. You can take part of it, leave other parts of it, see how you feel about it. So there are five stages, okay? Uh, we've got stage one is access. Now what she's talking about here, access and motivation, she says nothing else will work in the online classroom unless you start with access, with, which gives motivation. In other words, students need to be familiar with the tech and you need to address issues of digital literacy. It's kind of obvious because if students can't log on or they don't know how to use Zoom or they don't know how to use the LMS, they won't feel motivated to keep going with the course. Not rocket science, but, and here's the big but, just because our students, for example, are teenagers or what might be called digital natives, we cannot assume they know how to use the technology or that they won't be demotivated by it. My children, for example, know lots about social media and stuff like TikTok. They know nothing about using Zoom or they didn't, whereas I did and or I might know about Moodle, but they've never used it before. So we can't make assumptions about our students and we have to deal with the tech. Stage two, and this relates to Anna's session. Um, in particular, she was um, talking about the importance of relationship building. Um, and what we're talking about here is building an online community, building rapport. So how do you get, you need to main, build and maintain relationships with your students, even though you're operating through Zoom, through a screen. Uh, build that rapport, build that human relationship with your students and students with each other. And also I put GTKY, getting to know you activities. Now, when we start face-to-face -face courses, we know all about icebreakers and getting to know you activities. Suddenly we were forced to go online and in, use Zoom or whatever the platform was. And we assumed that we didn't have to spend time on online socialization because the students already knew each other. But actually the online context presents a new environment. And in a way you have to start again and you have to build those relationships again and students have to get to know each other again. And it's interesting, I don't know if you found it, you can comment in the chat room if you like, but I find some students, their personalities perhaps change online or relationships are different. So confident students from the face-to-face -face class might be less confident in the online platform and vice versa. 
So there's a bit of time needed there to get students up and running again. So that's what we're talking about in terms of online socialization. So we need to remind ourselves it was important to have all the kinds of activities that we might normally do with uh, students in a face to face class to get them to know each other and, and remember as teachers to keep the rapport going. Stage three, um, information exchange. She, Sam and says, once you've dealt with the tech, once you've dealt with the online socialization, then you get on to the teaching, if you like. What she's calling information exchange, for me in the English language teaching classroom is, is teaching. It's presenting language, it's presenting grammar, presenting vocabulary, um, checking the students' work, uh, and so on. Um, and I'll come back to that in some more detail later on. But we get teaching, maybe we're sharing our course book, maybe we're presenting something on the whiteboard and so on. But stage three only works if we've paid attention to stage one and stage two, basically. Thanks for the comments coming up in the chat box. Interesting comments about um, stage one and stage two there. So we get onto information exchange and that means the teacher presenting or exchanging information, presenting language, but it's also about the students coming back and them exchanging information, both with the teacher and each other, which then leads to what she calls knowledge construction. Knowledge constructions are all the good stuff, the group work, the critical thinking, the problem solving tasks, all the higher order thinking. And the key word there is breakout rooms. Uh, if you use Zoom and similar um, online learning, it's the moment where you send the students off and they construct knowledge, they construct new texts, maybe they prepare presentations, maybe they go on web quests and they have to research something online, but they create something new with the language. Finally, stage five for Salmon would be the development stage where students develop their development and we see their progress. Uh, maybe they do some creative work, uh, write a story, create a presentation, some of the things that uh, Antonia was talking about in her session on creativity. Personalization becomes really important. Show and tell activities that were mentioned in Scott's session is all about the students personalizing language and presenting something of themselves. And also Salmon would say development is about reflecting, reflecting on your learning and how you learn and the process. And we'll come to that a little later on. So that's basically her five stage model. And you can see how stages three to five go from sort of lower order to, to higher order thinking. Um, let's drill down now and take this in more detail. And I'm going to present each stage in more detail. I'm going to show you certain activities that might illustrate. There are activities you could use next week or things you could adapt. Let's start with stage one, access. Now, well, you've all been working on Zoom for a while, so access to the technology, you may have solved a lot of these issues. Um, but students need to understand the platform that they're working on, basically. And uh, we can give instructions to students on how to access the technology. But uh, for example, one activity you might do it with students, if you're using a piece of technology for the first time, you might do a poll with students. So in the chat box, put your answer to this question. I suspect you're all gonna type in A, but I might be wrong. Um, Sandra put, would put C, for example, first time. So it's interesting, we can make assumptions that everybody in the room has zoomed Zoom, but maybe some people haven't, and those people need to be incorporated. Um, but this kind of poll is a quick and easy way to find out um, to find out uh, what students already know. Now I could spend time explaining Zoom to my students, but we're English language teachers primarily. We're not tech instructors. So we need to think about, well, what language do students need in order to operate with Zoom? So for example, I created um, this kind of activity where I took a screenshot of Zoom and instead of checking that students knew where to click, 
I gave them a list of phrases they might use when operating with Zoom. So I was teaching them the English they would need, for example, and they matched the phrase to the part of Zoom. Um, so there's that kind of language, which obviously, if you wanted to teach imperatives as well, is a nice activity because it's full of imperatives, for example. Uh, another similar activity is teaching students the language they need to solve problems with the technology. So if you can't see another part participant, students need to know the phrase that says, you know, have you turned on your video, that kind of language. So instead of just instructing them, actually give them, teach them the English they're going to need and turn it into an English language lesson. You'll have done a lot of this stuff um, way back in lockdown, but these are the thing, this is what, what Salmon's getting at when we're talking about access. Uh, another example of this would be a guide to Zoom etiquette. So when you first start working with Zoom or any platform, um, you might say to students, well, here are six tips for Zoom etiquette, which is good or bad advice. The students read the tips and then they have to say which they think is appropriate behavior. This is useful when you're first setting up the course and you're getting students to think about, well, what is appropriate and what isn't appropriate, for example. Um, all of these tips, I'm going to give you a link to them at the end. So if you still want to use them in class, you can, or if you want to adapt them. Uh, but again, this kind of text is also a nice way to introduce certain language areas, such as imperatives or the language for uh, giving advice, for example. So you can quickly turn it into a language lesson. Okay, so that's access, access to the, to the technology. Next one, online socialization. Um, nowadays, we're having to keep our distance from everybody, but when we use technology in the classroom, there's an automatic distance um, that we have with our students, which affects our language teaching. Um, uh, both Anna and also Magda picked up on this. Magda talked about the importance of positive emotions. And I think that's very true and we have to achieve it through technology uh, and develop online socialization. We have to spend some time thinking about this um, when we're getting a course going. And it's one of the reasons I think we don't maintain and continue to engage learners because we haven't devoted our time to it. I mean, one tip is make sure that you have those few minutes at the beginning and the end of the class just for making small talk and chatting with your students. Set aside a little bit of the time as students arrive um, to, to, to deal with rapport building. Sandy's going to be talking about it as well. Okay. Um, other tips for online socialization. I said I do an asynchronous course using an LMS. So in my course in Oxford, obviously I would introduce myself on the LMS. Uh, but I just think it's a bit dull if you just provide a bit of text. So I always say to my students, I want to see a photograph related to where you come from. So this is a windmill that's near me that I took one, one evening. So I share the picture with my students and then they would write a reply to me on the LMS and they would share a photograph as well. Simple, straightforward, but it's helping with the online socialization. Uh, another tool I really like for asynchronous teaching is Photobabble. Um, Photobabble, I'm going to refer to it later, but if you uh, Google Photobabble, you'll find it's a free to use tool. Basically, it allows you to take a photograph of something and then record yourself describing it. Um, you can use it in all sorts of different ways and I'll show it again later. But for example, it's a nice tool to use at the beginning of a course because students can photograph themselves and then record themselves introducing themselves. So if I want to introduce myself, it would sound like this. I hope you can hear this. Um... Hi, my name's John and I'm going to be your teacher for this term. Uh, this is a photo I took over my summer holidays. It's on the Isle of Skye in Scotland. It was a very cold day, but very beautiful. Anyway, I look forward to meeting you all in class. Uh, what I'd like you to do is follow the link below to Photo Babble and take your own photo and record a similar introduction about yourself 
and post it here. Okay, dead easy. I'm scaffolding the activity, showing the picture, describing it. But what I love about it as a language teacher is that I also, early on the course, get a sample of the students speaking and I can listen to the recording and already identify issues the students might have. So it's doing two things. It's setting up online socialization, but for me as the teacher, it's an opportunity to start to think about what is the level of the students I'm gonna be working with and I can refer to it. Um, it's, it's free to use, it's very simple to set up and so on. Uh, but a nice little tool there, not complicated. Other things of online socialization, obviously take activities that you do in the classroom and you just put them online. So I did the classic uh, I was working with students who already knew me quite well and so in the LMS discussion forum I put up three statements about myself and said which two statements are true which is false and because they already knew me this was a way of developing online socialization and picking up on something new so which do you think is false kids can says it's number two Anybody else want to guess which sentence is false, three is false, one is false, three is false. Okay, and so on. Uh, in actual fact, number one is false. I grew up on a dairy farm with cows, not with sheep is the catch. The rest is, is all true. And if I'm doing, I could do this synchronously in Zoom or I can do it asynchronously in Moodle. Other people then log on the next person who logs on reads it and they reply to me, they guess which one is wrong and then they write their statements and then another student logs on and they respond to the student before them who was called Jeanette and they guess and they write their three and so on and that you get a chain of messages left in the asynchronous platform. Simple online socialization, simple way of taking a classic ELT activity that we would normally use in face to face, putting it online, but all helping online socialization. Even with students who know you quite well, don't ignore the need for the socialization, the rapport building in order to maintain the interest. Okay. So we've looked at access, we looked at online socialization in the Salmon model. Stage three, information exchange. Here Salmon is basically talking about, this is where the teaching really starts. And it's really interesting early on in this whole six month period that we've had, um, because I'm a course book writer, I soon got sucked into uh, teacher training and providing teacher support to teachers on how on earth do we use course books with Zoom? You know, can we have it on the screen? Do we use the, the presentation tool? Do we take a digital version of the book? The other problem, uh, well, the first thing that teachers started doing, not surprisingly, was sticking up a page of the, of the course book on the screen. So this is from a course book I've written called um, World English. Um, so it's the reading page. So imagine you're the teacher, you come to this class, you put it up on the screen and you start doing the reading with the students. And so it's you, the teacher, exchanging the content with the students. And not surprisingly, um, I, when you start to observe teachers teaching through Zoom and also myself, you have that wonderful function of being able to record the lesson. Um, the thing is, if you watch the lesson back, you start to notice the lack of interaction and the lack of exchange. It's really easy to get locked into just teaching from the course book on the screen. You know, we have that phrase for presentations, uh, death by PowerPoint. I talk about death by screen sharing these days because it's so easy to just talk like I'm doing now and I'm needing the interaction from the chat box. But death by screen sharing just means that you just work through the exercises in the course book and all the information exchange chain disappears. So very quickly, uh, what I started doing and what teachers started doing was identifying the bits of the course book where more exchange could take place. 
Um, exactly, Sandy, if they're on the phone, you have that challenge as well. So in this book, for example, they do a reading, ironically, about making your vacation more interesting. To be honest, at the moment, I just like a vacation anywhere. I don't care where, I just like to go away for a while. Um, but anyway, that was the topic. They do the reading exercises, and then there's the goal check at the end where students get into groups. And normally if I was in class, I'd put them into groups of three or four and they discuss going on vacation. Um, simply in Zoom or whatever platform, we can put them in the breakout room and they can do that activity and they can start exchanging with each other. So that's an important step that teachers started to cotton onto quite quickly. Um, here's another example of using a course book to exchange information. You work through the exercises. Now, this is a lesson I did with my students in Oxford because they're students who need to go for job interviews. So we use this page out of life. We did the exercises. But then the chat box came into it, uh, its own. I said to the students, stop, I want you in the chat box to type the type of questions that you think you will get asked at job interviews. So in the chat box, they started to type questions like, what are your professional goals? Tell me about your background. What's been your biggest challenge? And so on, and they typed it in. Then we took the questions and I had a small group and we role played on the screen somebody asking the questions, somebody answering the questions. And in the chat box, I let the students ask and answer the questions, but in the chat box, I was making a note of pronunciation problems. For example, I had one student who answered, I'd like to be a permanent researcher in a good university. She had problems saying the word permanent because she wasn't putting the word stress on the first syllable. So I just typed in the chat box, per in capital letters, and then the rest of the word in small letters. She had problems saying the word quality. In fact, I thought she was saying quarantine at one point. She was saying quality. Uh, she had trouble saying the word management, analysis, clinical. So I was using the chat box as a way to correct the word stress and for her to see uh, where the errors were. Now, for me, that's real kind of information exchange at work and really making use of Zoom. The other thing, we often talk about how do we adapt face-to-face -to, -face to online teaching and what are the limitations? Um, Scott was saying, I don't know how we can do an activity in Zoom in a certain kind of way. Having said that, Zoom does offer one enormous advantage compared to normal classroom teaching, and that's that you can record the lesson so easily. Uh, you can record a lesson, send it to teachers. But what I did here, for pronunciation, I think Zoom is fantastic because what it allowed me to do was I, at the end of the lesson, recorded the words that students had had problems saying, I recorded them with a gap and then I sent them the Zoom recording of me saying the words. And then they listened to it for homework and they listened to me and they practiced saying the words. So it was a way of personalizing the homework, um, uh, personalizing the homework um, so that they could work on their pronunciation. Yes. I, Glenn, I guess this is Glenn, there is that issue of recording under 18s, this was with young adults, but it's, but, but it's a feature of Zoom that I particularly like. Um, and it, it makes, for me, it's a way of breaking out of the course book. If you've ever come to another talk, so I talk about heads up, heads down teaching. In the face-to-face -face class, um, heads down teaching quite often is when we just work through the course book and we need those moments of heads up when students heads are out of the book looking at the teacher looking at each other. Um, in terms of Zoom, heads up teaching is things like uh, chat boxes, breakout rooms, interactive use of the whiteboard students working together. So that's, it's that lifting them out of the course book, doing the exercises and that kind of thing. Which then brings us to stage four of Salmon's model, which is knowledge construction, which is things like group work and problem solving. And it's the moment when you say goodbye to the students and you let them get on with it. 
is, is generally my view of it. They construct a new text or they do some sort of research project together. Let me give you a, a simple example of what I mean. I was doing a lesson on relative clauses and I have to say relative clauses is one of my least favorite grammar points. In the chat box you can type in your least favorite grammar point to teach if you like, but relative clauses is mine because I kind of understand it, but when students say, but why is it defining and not non-defining, or why is it non-defining and not defining, those are the moments in class I go into slight meltdown and, and I panic, and sometimes I have to sort of go away and think about it. Um, but anyway, if you're teaching relative clauses as I was, um to some b2 level students upper intermediate for me relative clauses is one of those upper intermediate types of grammar if a student's using relative clauses well in their writing then you 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 know that they're sort of in the area of b2 it's a it's a good way to to check students level when you're looking at their writing what I did uh, with my students who were working on uh, relative clauses, I gave them this text uh, from a book I'd written um, where you give them the most boring story in the world. It has to have about four or five sentences and nothing much happens. Now there's different ways you can do it. You can put the text up on the whiteboard and the class can all work on the text together or you can send them off to the breakout rooms and they can work together in groups but the idea is they try and add as many defining and non-defining relative clauses to the story as possible um, so here we've got the story of um, at the weekend a man moved into an apartment block he didn't know anyone in the building his neighbors invited him to their party on the fifth floor the party started at eight o'clock he met lots of others and then i had a small class i let them just take over the whiteboard and expand the story so i'll just let you read their story and because you're all language teachers you'll immediately identify the mistakes but keep going just have a quick read Okay, but what you get is knowledge construction because the students are working together, they're exchanging ideas um, and so on, and they expand the story and suddenly it becomes much more interesting and they discover how fantastic relative clauses are to make writing more interesting. Um, now, of course, this text contains mistakes, errors with punctuation, uh, all sorts of things and as a teacher i could feed in the error correction there i could rewrite it with the students to make it correct uh, like this and i don't fully change it but we start to edit the text so we start to take their relative clauses and make it feel kind of more interesting or i could give it to the students say take it home for homework rewrite it make it even better check the grammar in it and so on but it's a nice it's a nice example of um, simply taking uh, a grammar point and letting students run with it in an online context that I think is is helpful for their knowledge construction. It goes beyond just information exchange because it's group work, it's problem solving. They're having to think critically about the grammar and how we use it, and they're eventually coming up with something quite creative. Which then brings us to the fifth stop to the top development and Salmon would say that at the top of all of this students need to develop they need to demonstrate their development but they also need to recognize the fact that they've developed um, and this is important particularly when you think one of the challenges is maintaining motivation and engaging students over a long period of time. If students don't see the development with online learning, then they, then they'll, they won't stay with you. Um, so ways of, of de recognizing development are important. For example, 
These slides are going to be available, Sandra, at the end. I will give you a link and you can download the whole lot as a PDF because I appreciate I'm throwing lots of things at you and activities so you can get all the slides and, and the links. Okay. Um, development. Uh, this page is from a course book called Life, where students learn how to talk about and describe photographs. And we're very lucky with the Life books because I get access to all sorts of interesting photographs. And I love the work of Rainier Gerritsen. If you Google Rainier Gerritsen, the photographer, he has a website. They are full of photographs of people um, not in photo stock type formats with everybody smiling at the camera, but real people that he shoots in interesting ways, which make them great if you're doing lessons on appearances and describing people because they're a rich source. Google Reiner Gerritsen photos. It's a great resource. Anyway, this page makes use of Reiner Gerritsen photos. And so it was talking about pictures and photos. Uh, oh yeah, and it's at the top of the page, the title of the lesson, Photos of Reiner Gerritsen. Um, so the students are learning the language for talking about pictures and photos. And then not surprisingly, at the end of the lesson, the students have to choose a photo or a picture they like and present it to their partner or to the class. And one thing you can do online actually is the students can go to the website of Ryan Gerritsen and choose another photo by him and present it. But what I like to do with this lesson is to get students to take their own photograph and present it. Um, rather than take a, choose a photograph that somebody famous has, has created. They just take, go home and take their own interesting photograph and present it. And in terms of development, obviously the last exercise on the page in any course book should focus on personalization, creativity and development. In the online context, um, you've got different options. You could either have students present their photograph through, uh, through Zoom. You could use um, Photobabble. So here I ask students to take photographs from a holiday, they had to upload their favorite holiday photograph and record a description of it. Yulia said you could use Padlet, any of the visual tools. Loom, I like to use a lot these days. Loom is my go-to tool for all sorts of things because it records your screen so you can show a photograph and describe it or share a video and so on. But it gives you, the teacher, a record of the student's speech and students can go and listen to each other after the class. Now, in terms of development, the other thing that I do uh, with both face-to-face -face and online teaching is I get students to create a checklist to give feedback to other presenters. So if students were going to um, do presentations presenting a photo that they'd made using Photobabble or Live, before they do the presentations, I would brainstorm with students, what makes a good presentation of a photo? In the chat box, can you just tell me what makes a good, what elements you would expect to see from your language students if they were giving a presentation in class of photos, for example? What would you wanna hear and see from them? I'll just let you type. It's gonna be relevant to the student, engaging, coherent, yes. So it is engaging, personalized. It could have comparing language, contrasting language, clear voice and delivery, vivid. Okay, nice. Uh, what language might you expect them to use? Adjectives, yes, for describing the photograph and so on. Possibly phrases and expressions to give the presentation structure. Prepositions on the left, on the top, at the bottom, on the right, that kind of thing, yep. Now, I could turn all your ideas into a checklist and say the checklist for giving feedback. I want everybody, I want to hear correct use of prepositions of place. I want to hear adjectives. Uh, I want your, to, your delivery to be clear, um, et cetera, et cetera, whatever you decide. But as a class, you brainstorm and you create the feedback form 
And then when the students watch each other's presentations, they can give each other feedback. Or if you don't want to do it that way, the student records their presentation when they're working with Zoom or Photobabble and they self correct or self analyze their own performance based on the criteria. And so they see their own development. And this is where I think the recording function of Zoom comes in or other recording features work well because students can go off by themselves, look at the recording, analyze it uh, and think about what feedback they would give themselves. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the development end. It's kind of the assessment end of things, but it's still personalization. It's about creativity. Just before we finish, uh, a couple of other things that come from Salmon um, on a course that I run um, for on online course design. Um, a lot of it is using the LMS Moodle. So it's students working asynchronously and they have to use discussion forums a lot. And part of development, Salmon would say, is getting the students to reflect on their own online learning. Now, as language teachers, we're familiar with this because we get students to say, think about yourself as a learner. What are your good learner habits? You know, what, what do good learners do? How do people learn language effectively? Salmon would say we also need to get the students to reflect on how they behave as online learners. So if you've got a class where a student's not participating, or uh, you've got a, a class where a student may be disruptive in some way or not switching on the camera, getting them to reflect on their participation, their role in online learning, it might throw up all sorts of reasons why they're struggling to participate. Um, let me give you a kind of fun example from Salmon. I've adapted this for language learners, um, but it gets people to think about what kind of online learner are you in the asynchronous uh, format. And she puts it into forms of animals. So if you're a wolf, you're the sort of person who visits once a week, is active, and then you disappear again. Um, or if you're an elephant, you're a regular participant. And it also applies if you use social media. In the chat box, have a quick read and type in what animal you think you probably are in your online behavior. Or if you've done online learning courses, what kind of animal do you think would describe you best? Let's see if there's any wolves or magpies amongst you. There's a magpie. So you work alone, you read the comments, but you don't really leave replies much. Oh, there's two magpies in the room. Any other animal types? Dolphins. You like to communicate a lot and you enjoy having fun in the chat. Good. Uh, rabbits. You live online, Shana. You leave lots of messages and respond very quickly. Oh, that's Victoria. And so on. It's a kind of fun activity, but it's getting students to think about what is my behavior? How do I operate? And it's kind of interesting to give this to students early on in a course and then give it to them later because sometimes students adjust their behavior once they've done this awareness raising activity. Um, it's kind of fun. It's quite good just because it's full of present simple verbs as well. Um, so you could use it for a, a linguistic aim. But I think it's a nice little tool to encourage reflection and it gets students to think about how they behave online. Uh, another obvious tool, which I think some of you have mentioned is Mentimeter. This comes from a course I'm doing. I've just finished this course for people. I ask them to reflect on the course and at, by the end of the course to say what three words make an effective online course. And I set it up with Mentimeter and each participant had to type in three words that resonated with them about online course design. You could do the same if you were getting your students to reflect about the course. You use the word cloud function in Mentimeter uh, and you get students to type in three words that say what describes them as an online learner. It's just another kind of reflective tool and helps with development. Um, so some ideas there, let's sum up. So the challenges, which most of you said at the beginning were using technology effectively, interactive lessons, and how do we maintain and engage learners? 
And I would argue, I think uh, Chris said earlier, the, the difference between face-to-face -face and online isn't quite as big as we make out, but I do think stages one and two um, of the salmon model, familiarity with the tech and online community are crucial. And then level three is much more, level four is much more our traditional teaching role using things like breakout rooms but then remembering that students need to see their development at the end. Okay, I've thrown a lot at you. Um, first of all, on that final slide there, you can go to my author site, which is John Hughes ELT. And if you go to the webinar presentations section, you will find the slides for this session. I've put it up today. It says the title of this talk and IH Torrent. You can just download the PDF. Um, the reference is there. There's the Salmon book, if you're interested. I also wrote a series of blog posts about um, teaching with Zoom and so on. Uh, some references to books there and my contact details are at the bottom. Uh, thank you very much for sticking with me and thank you for Glenn for giving me the opportunity to talk. Glenn, I don't know if we have any time for uh, questions at all. Thank you very much, John. I'm afraid not, no. Um, we've still got quite a few more present presenters coming. Um, but of course, if anybody has any questions, please do contact John direct. Um, you did send your email. Can you just remind the email again, please, John? Pop it in the chat. Um, yep. If you go to johnhughesylt.com there, or john at hughesylt.com. There's my website and my email. You can download the slides from there. And if you have any questions that come out of this, feel free to email me and ask me the questions. That's 